two beers. What do you have? I'll have two beers, too. Just two beers? Yes, sir. Well, hello, folks, and it's great to be back with you once again, wherever you are, whether you're on vacation in the high multitudes or right in the middle of your daily duties. In case you don't already know, I'm Patrick Vasey, the author of the Laurel and Hardy blog, and the host of this, the Laurel and Hardy blogcast, and you're listening to episode 7. Coming up and following on from last time will be part 2 of our interview with Laurel and Hardy encyclopedia author Glenn Mitchell, where among other things we'll be discussing the 1927 oddity that is Flying Elephants, and we'll also be taking a look at the life and career of one of its stars, Viola Richard. She's the sweetest girl you ever saw. So put on your best Flintstones costume, grab your club, and let's get this underway. Last time on the blogcast, we had a great chat with the author of the Laurel and Hardy Encyclopedia, Glenn Mitchell, and it's proved to be a really popular episode indeed. Glenn talked to us about his career history, his thoughts on Do Detectives Think, and we also talked about uh, Noah Young. So if you haven't heard episode six yet, make sure you do so. Uh, But before we start off today, I just thought it might be worth giving you a very brief recap to bring you back up to speed. I'm so excited about today's special guest on the blogcast, as he's a man that really needs no introduction. So it is with great pleasure that I welcome today's guest, Glenn Mitchell. Glenn, welcome to the Laurel and Hardy blogcast. Thank you, Patrick. It's good to be here. I just wanted to ask you about Laurel and Hardy themselves. What is it about Stan and Babe that actually appeals to you? What makes them so special, Glenn? Mm. Yeah, I've never found it's an easy question to answer. It, it, it goes back to the principle that who they are and what they do and the things, the situation they get themselves into, it could very easily happen to anyone. And there's such a bond between them as well. I mean, it's, this is not a cold partnership. These two have a genuine fraternal bond and... That gives them a, a, a human element that I think we can relate relate to quite easily. And they're, they're an exaggeration of real people, but they seem real. And we can, we can see them as being our friends. That, I think, is what sets them apart from all of the rest. And I do mean all of the rest. My thoughts of new detectives think, uh, it's a key development film. Um, it, <laughs> it's one of the most unfortunate films in comedy history in many ways, because it lost its claim to fame as being the first authentic looking Laurel and Hardy film. It was, it was usurped when duck soup turned up. <laughs> I found something years ago in, in the kinematograph weekly, which was talking about these very early reissues and they'd obviously been confused by the billing of them as well, because um, they were looking at flying elephants and they were saying it, it featured both Laurel and Hardy and at the same time, they were reviewing the far more typical do detectives think, which they had down as being Laurel only. So you kind of wonder if their reviewer must have spent much of his time at the bar or something instead of at the screening. I have no idea. But I think this was probably not helped by the original billing. Yeah, so. Which leads us almost neatly to flying elephants, of course. It doesn't. That's, that's a wonderful little segue. I that, uh, <laughs> couldn't have planned that better if we'd have tried. <laughs> <laughs> Good afternoon and welcome to Contrived Links for Us. Flying Elephants was a two-reeler filmed May 9th to May 14th and June 19th, 1927. It was produced by Hal Roach, it was directed by Hal Roach and Frank Butler, its main cast was Stan Laurel, Oliver Hardy, James Finlayson and Viola Richard. After Do Detectives Think, it seemed to all intents and purposes that Hal Roach and his studio team had hit the jackpot. The magic of the Laurel and Hardy characters had been identified, albeit there were still some small adjustments to be made, but we were there, weren't we? Given that Detectives and Elephants were filmed almost back-to-back in May 1927, how did they go from the accomplished Do Detectives Think to the bizarre spectacle of Flying Elephants? For this point in the boy's career and development, this film to me, it is just plain bizarre. If it was 1924 and the film was a Stan Laurel comedy made during Stan's time with Joe Rock or some other studio, then I probably wouldn't even bat an eyelid. 
But the boys had started to create well-formed characters and the studio were releasing well-thought-out films with well-developed cags. Flying Elephants is like something out of the arc compared with films like its predecessor. I'm not saying that it's a bad film, it just feels totally out of place in the Laurel and Hardy chronology. As the unthinking detectives, we were presented with Laurel and Hardy not only working together as a team, but also dressed in very familiar attire, shabby suits and trademark derbies. But Flying Elephants rips the boys away from this environment and drops them into a land before time, a prehistoric Stone Age world full of low-browed, knuckle-dragging cavemen and an extremely dodgy-looking dinosaur. The boys are almost unrecognisable, with Stan's character, the very effeminate little twinkle star, clothed in animal furs and looking like he's wearing one of Harpo Marx's rejected wigs, prances around throughout as if he'd had one too many down at the local watering hole. Now, although watching Stan frantically skipping, scissor-kicking and generally flouncing around is always fun, this really and quite frustratingly is character regression rather than progression. Little Twinkle Star is a complete throwback to the type of performances familiar in Stan solo films. In fact, the whole film itself is a regression back to some very early types of silent comedies. As with all of the boys' pre-team films, however, it must be kept in mind that we view these movies from our informed and contemporary viewpoints. Yet in this case, the audiences in 1927 must likewise have been fairly bemused. This was to be the last film that Roach produced for distribution by the now-struggling Pathé Exchange, having signed a new deal with Giants Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer. Pathé, so prominent throughout the greater part of the 1920s, would lose not only the distribution rights to all the Hal Roach productions, but also the comedies of Max Sennett and Harold Lloyd too. It would be another eight months after Elephants was completed before Pathé released it to theatres during which time the Laurel and Hardy team had become an incredibly popular act and their names on movie billboards were attracting huge audiences for films such as The Second Hundred Years, Hats Off, Putting Pants on Philip and Battle of the Century. Even then, Pathé, either through ignorance or sheer incompetence, failed to capitalise on the boys' popularity and didn't promote detectives or elephants as Laurel and Hardy comedies. As an example, Glenn Mitchell describes in episode 6 of the Laurel and Hardy blogcast, the poster for Detectives only billed Stan Laurel and Jimmy Finlayson as stars of the picture, despite Hardy's very prominent role. The plot to Flying Elephants, this bizarre spectacle, has the Stone Age King Ferdinand ordering all men must marry on pain of death. Clearly, strange laws existed in Nevada even back then. Ollie, dressed in furs and sporting an equally horrendous hairpiece, and identified by the title cards merely as the Mighty Giant, starts out full of bravado and claims that he can get five women in five minutes. In reality, his attempts only result in being bashed on the head by his intended's real partners. It's during one of these wooing attempts that Ollie, partaking in small talk, mentions the weather and points out that the elephants are flying south as the shot cuts to some nicely animated elephants flying across the sky. As author Randy Scratved informs us, the animator for this clip was Roy Seawright, who, having started at the Roach Studios as an office boy, and then worked his way into the props department, had just taken sole charge of the Hal Roach cartoon department, and would go on to make a name for himself in the field of visual special effects. Eventually, Big Brutish Ollie and Skip Happy Stan, sorry, Little Twinkle Star, both choose to woo Viola Richard, the daughter of Saxophonist the Wizard, played by James Finlayson. Finlayson's role is pretty static and he's not given a lot to do, which is a shame and a waste of his talent, really. The boys must go head to head in a contest to see who will win the hand of the sought after Viola. Stan is the lady's favourite, yet Ollie wins the challenge and intends to claim his prize until Finlayson gives Stan an idea of how to cheat and ultimately come away victorious. The cunning plan is basically murder. Stan tells Ollie that to claim his lover he must spot her from off the edge of a cliff. Whilst Ollie is looking for his new mate, Stan closes his eyes and gives Ollie a kick up the backside in an attempt to push him over the cliff edge to his doom. However, little Twinkle Star's kick is pathetic and Ollie spins around, now wise to the deadly ruse. He approaches menacingly, ready to wreak his revenge, until a mountain goat sprints up and butts Ollie off the cliff, much to Stan's delight. In addition to the main cast, the film also has small yet arguably unrecognisable roles for extras such as Tiny Sanford, Leo Willis and Dorothy Coburn, as well as Faye Lamphere and Bud Fine. 
According to Randy Scretvet again, the film was shot in Moapa, Nevada, which is 60 miles northeast of Las Vegas. Vegas in 1927 was nothing much more than a water stop for the railroads running between Los Angeles and New Mexico. The first casino is not arriving until the early 1930s, as a form of entertainment for the male labourers who were employed building the Boulder Dam, later renamed the Hoover Dam. The whole area was wild and rugged, and Moapa was chosen for this reason. Babe Hardy would have been familiar with this area, as he'd co-starred in a roach western called No Man's Law just a few months earlier, and which was shot about 20 miles from Moapa on land actually owned by Hal Roach. To get there, the studio team, including the boys, James Finlayson, Viola Richard and Hal Roach himself, had to travel by train from Los Angeles. Recourse to the available trade papers of the day suggests that the film was received positively. With this enthusiastic review, written by Chester J. Smith for Motion Picture News, February 11th, 1928. A rather unusual comedy, away from the usual stereotyped stuff, is this latest Hal Roach effort. It goes back to the Stone Age with cave women and giants dominating the action, and as a result it develops some very passable humour. James Finlayson, Oliver Hardy, Stan Laurel, Viola Richard, Faye Lampier and Dorothy Coburn head a splendid cast under the direction of Frank Butler, and they get all the fun possible out of the two reels. The action is fast and furious, and there are some unusually funny situations developed. The theme deals with the edicts of the Stone Age, with cave women, giants and atheists, and the power of brain over brawn, which triumphs largely by the aid of a goat of tremendous butting proclivities. It is all very unique as these comedies go and should prove a good attraction because it is far removed from the usual run of comedies. Stan Laurel, who has always been among the leaders in the short comedy field, does some exceptionally good work in this one and is ably assisted in the many humorous complications and situations which arise by other members of the cast. Faye Lampia also contributes a full measure of the comedy element. It's interesting to note the order with which Mr Smith lists the actors, with James Finlayson mentioned first, followed by Babe, and then Stan. It certainly seems to illustrate that there was no sense of a Laurel and Hardy team emerging at this point, even in the wake of Do Detectives Think? And it also illustrates how much of a leading player Finlayson was, to be listed first even though his part in the film was fairly minor. Away from the studios, the two actors were having very different experiences domestically, the previous year, 1926, and with the help of producer Joe Rock, Stan had finally managed to untangle himself from a very prolonged and unhappy relationship with his ex-stage partner, May Dahlberg. And now, in 1927, he was happily married to Lois Nielsen, and they were expecting their first child together. The baby arrived in December of that same year, and was named Lois after her mother. Conversely, Babe Hardy was not faring so well. He'd been married to Myrtle Lee Reeves since 1921, but things were not easy in the Hardy household. His relationship with his wife was starting to deteriorate due to her problems with alcohol. Despite his love for Myrtle and his attempts to care for her amidst her addiction, and at great financial and emotional cost to himself, they would eventually divorce in 1933. Overall, Flying Elephants is a real oddment. There are a number of amusing gags and the boys display some recognisable mannerisms. Hardy, despite playing the role of a brutish giant, does show glimpses of the Ollie character that would soon become recognised around the world, such as his genteel daintiness and subtle expressions. And in my opinion, he puts in a show-stealing performance here. Stan, on the other hand, skips and dances his way through most of the film, and he does actually appear to be enjoying himself. His performance is indeed amusing, but frustratingly he's so far away from the Stanley character that he'd been successfully developing up to this point. I think it's fair to say that the sight of a group of elephants flying through the sky would be fantastically memorable, but sadly, the same can't be said for this film. Fine elephants. You can talk about somebody spending too, too long at the bar. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what on earth they were thinking about with this one. Um, can you can you help me out with this one, Glenn, and just fill me in a little bit as to you know what on earth is going on with flying elephants? <laughs> I think the best description of it is a dolly. A dolly. A, a roach dude goes out into the middle of nowhere to fool around for a while. <laughs> okay. That's that's the best description, I think, because the whole thing looks ad libbed. Some some slender plot justification, but otherwise they're messing about. 
But yes, they decided to call it Flying Elephants again because, of course, there's that famous animated shot of Ollie pointing out Flying Elephants, this being prehistory. Um, this, according to Randy Scrut, that was the the early work of Roy Seawright, who became the head of special effects at Hal Roach. And uh, he himself apparently didn't care much what he'd achieved, but what he thinks is very good, and I, I do. Um, they're the most convincing flying elephants I've ever seen. <laughs> and probably the only flying elephants I've ever seen. <laughs> I hope the only ones. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yes, one can never assume. But uh, but no, that's what it's called, flying elephants. For those who don't know, it's obviously set in a, a kind of a prehistoric setting. But it the, just the look of the film is prehistoric in itself. You know, the, I mean, I think the the print probably quality is not um, you know up to up to scratch. Oh, um, no. I mean, the twenty one disc set I've got from Universal, it, it's it's a very poor print, which makes it look even older than it is. But uh, so I don't think that helps. Um, it's a barrier. It really is a barrier. And it was always, it was always difficult. Um, I mentioned that Youngson managed to get good 35 on Do Detectives Think for the further perils of Lauren and Hardy. Um, he couldn't get good 35 for Flying Elephants, but he used it. He tended to avoid anything he couldn't get in good quality. Right. That's, that's why the pathways that were only around on 16 mil don't feature, because he wasn't willing to blow up the 16 mil footage to you. He wanted to use top quality material in terms of image, top quality material, but if, if anything, to impress modern audiences who have this received idea that all other movies look terrible when they were new. Of course, they didn't. He was on a bit of a mission and had to prove otherwise. And uh, there's, there's kind of an, an apology clause in the narration because he refers to the early and rare flying elephants and rare, the implication being this is the best we could get yeah, without actually so saying. And uh, so he was conscious of it and uh, it wasn't great. It still looked a lot better than the usual copies. Um, the, uh, for some reason, 16 mil copies of flying elephants were not as good as the usual standard. They were usually pretty good at, at the very least. Very some of them very good indeed. Not flying elephants. And this used to circulate in copies with that title, and a lot of people knew it as Stone Age Romance. Which would make more sense. Yeah, it, it, it's a logical title. It, it turned up in home movie form a lot in Stone Age Romance. Uh, but whichever title it had, the, the copies are always pretty ropey, and even now it's difficult to get one that looks anything, even the best material is. And as I said, it is a barrier to enjoyment. However used you may be to archive film in its often parlor state, does influence how much you can enjoy a film. You can't mentally tune out all of it. And I feel that I feel that it would probably seem a much better film if you had a good print. Yeah, I'd agree with that. And in fact, I, I mentioned this to, to Chris again when we talked about Atoll K, the first print I saw of that was absolutely uh, revolting. Uh, and, and it just, I mean, that's hard enough to watch at best of times. Uh, yeah, yeah. The, you know, the new Blu-ray makes it so much easier, but with a horrible sludgy print, oh, forget it, I just switched it off. You know, it was, it was awful. Um, but uh, yeah. no, it, a barrier, absolutely. I'd agree with that, Glenn. Yeah, and, um, well, you know, Flying Elephants isn't exactly Atoll K. <laughs> 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 it's you know it, it is it is extremely silly, and and it's frustrating because we know now. It's e I suppose I shouldn't really take this this attitude because hindsight is awfully. Easy. Um, we can look at this and say they got it right with duck soup. Why did they throw that away and start splitting them up and doing this sort of untypical stuff? Got it right again with do detectives think why did they then revert to these two opposing characters working solo and we're seeing it from the perspective of a public who are used to seeing their mature work as a whole yes time at the time these were one offs they were they were not looking to to this being a continuing thing they didn't even start to look at lauren and hardy being a continuing ongoing thing until they moved to mvm even then, not initially, look at Sugar Daddies, they split up again. Uh, it was only after that that they started to see this as a regular permanent thing. But at the time, it was just on to the next. And it didn't matter whether it didn't match what they'd done in the previous film. It, if anything, the mother prefers to do something different, something new. So, so it's very easy to sit at this vantage point and say, we don't understand why they reverted. But 
it was just a series of one-offs. No continuity intended. Yeah, no, that's a very good point. Yeah, and, and Stan was still finding himself, refinding himself, the former. He's he's in scissors kick mode in flying a little. Oh yeah, to little, an absurd little, little, degree. Little, little twinkle star. Little twinkle star, yeah. and, and, <laughs> <laughs> and doing the effeminate bit <laughs> as well, which he tried in with love and kisses. Yeah, and what? Yes. Um, not uh, not meant to be not meant to be gay, but just a just effete manner and um, generally. Uh, not one's idea of a tough guy. Uh, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this reminds me of something. Um, something again. Peter Mickelson pointed out to me actually a while ago. Uh, qu- quite, uh, quite often, silent films turn up, and there's and not all of the title cards are in. You get the occasional missing, and you think, oh, what's that? But with the MGMs, it's a lot easier to replace them because they all had cutting. So, uh, for those who, who don't know what that is, it's a complete typewritten record of a film, shot by shot, detailing the action at each stage, and in the case of silent films, giving the contents of the sub. So you know word for word what was in an MGM. But there aren't those for the cafes. And there's a wonderful scene where Stan has just come off decidedly the worst against um, a female wrestler, uh, Dorothy Coburn. The most fetching and assertive. <laughs> yeah, that's, right. that's right. Yeah, there's this wonderful fight between them called Stan, <laughs> is this moment. And there's usually a title card for Stan that's missing at the end of this. And um, at least one attempt has been made, I think. I, I, I'm assuming this was a, a fabricated title because they had to have a title there to respond. respond. I don't know. But it it's a game that to me doesn't ring true, but Peter several years ago said that he'd got a hold of uh, an old, old print of it. Um, Kodak cinegraph print, and it's got the title in. Okay. And what stands, what Stan actually says to her is ain't been the same since my operation. <laughs> 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 now given his overall demeanor, really don't want to ponder what that, that <laughs> yeah. <didn't> tell. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> the implications might also explain why somebody thought it best to remove that yeah. title. <laughs> That's ahead of its time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, let's just to suggest that uh, there might have been a, a soprano aspect to his unheard singing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Brilliant. Oh, so, uh, but yeah, um, so Stan is still being this semi effeminate creature of. 11 hisses and leaping about like a lunatic. And Ollie's in full blustering bully mode. Um, these, these, these guys, they're both in the same film. They don't even meet until it's nearly over. And then it's straight into a three-hander with Finderson, which kind of reflects what the, the, what the direction that they, that they intended to take it in, because um, going by a lot of the publicity, even by the earlier MGMs, um, there seems not to be an attempt not to them as a new duo, but as a new trio. Yes, yeah, yeah. Quite a lot of the publicity from 27 suggested it was intended as a trio. And here we have them brought together towards the end of this as a trio. Again, they weren't looking at that time as Laurel and Hardy as an ongoing regular thing. The most they were looking at was Laurel, Hardy and Finlayton as an ongoing trio. The sad truth of it was that he was destined to be a supporting comedian. He was never going to be a star comic in the way that they were, they could be and, and became. It, it, and, and they'd already learned that because before that, they tried at Roach to make in the a star comic. They gave him a series. And that's when Laurel and Hardy first worked together at Roach, 1925. Um, Stan Laurel was co-directing one of the Phyllis Firing series, yes, yes, the net, and Oliver Hardy was in the cast. So there we had Laurel and Hardy working together at Roach, but separated by the camera, <laughs> not together on screen. But but Finlayson was there, and Laurel was co-directing some of the others in that series, was beating the chase. I think the only other one of those I'd seen, maybe it sort of exists. I don't know. But um, but Finlayson was being tried at that time as a star comedian. It didn't quite work. And his, his next chance was as part of the trio with Laurel and Hardy. And that didn't quite work either. 
And it's no coincidence that once Laurel Ann Hardy had become the thing without Finn Lisson, he, he went for a while. He tried his luck elsewhere with different studios back maybe, what, 18 months or something years. So, uh, but he obviously felt that his, his time at Rotor at that point was at least over for a while. But, uh, but you know, as of flying elephants, they were still seeking to make them a th- a th- And um, it doesn't work as do detective think does. And you, they've got these, this embryonic team in an embryonic setting. And I understand that the only reason that they went out there, this was, um, uh, what's it called? Moapa, Moapa Nevada. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's 60 miles north of Las Vegas or something. And the reason they were there was that Roach owned the land. Yes, yeah, so I believe. Yes, that's right. Yeah, he, wrote, he he owned the land there, so they could roam around in the heart's intent. And it was wrong. They'd, they'd already used it not long before for No Man's Law, that western with Henderson and Hardy. That's right, yes. Yeah, that's quite a dark one, isn't it? Oh, yes, it is. Uh, some of that. Um, they, they can't make up their minds what they want to be, what they want to be doing with that is because they've got really dark, menacing things going on, particularly as regards intent towards the heroine and so on. Some of the things, the implications there are very dark indeed. And yet they've got fairly standard slapsticky things such as um, Hardy's business with the, the eye pack that can flap up and down, <laughs> Finlet and landing on a cactus <laughs> and so on. So it's, it's very much caught in between two schools, two sets of intention. Very peculiar film in that regard. So where are we? Um, no you know, we're some, we are behind the Arpa. Yeah, where dinosaurs fear to tread, <laughs> and uh, they've only got one. Um, they they were still buying into the, to the commonplace myth about um, early humans coexisting with coexisting with dinosaurs, <laughs> but the only nod in that direction was a, a prop triceratops, <laughs> which they wheel in at some point. <laughs> Yeah, this is this was this was a, a sop to the dinosaur market, and uh, they feel they had to have one. Of them. Was this the, uh, was the theme? Because um, I, I know I've seen Chaplin uh, do a sort of a Stone Age comedy. I think Keaton did a Stone Age yeah. comedy. Was was this some kind of a, a genre that was popular? I mean, surely not by nineteen twenty seven. Because I'm sure Keaton and Chaplin would have been a lot sooner than that. Well, that's the thing. They all did it occasionally. I think it was just a period in history that. Um, Different comedians have had a crack at, and because uh, it has potential, it wasn't anything they they, they wanted to do as an ongoing thing. Um, yeah. Left that for the Flintstones, but uh, yeah, I mean they did the same thing. I mean um, Chaplin, yeah, as you say, did it. He he did his, his last Keystone, his prehistoric past, which was actually a send up of a, of a Griffith film called Man's Genesis. That's what prompted Chaplin to do it. He was parodying Griffith. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Um, Keaton did it in, in one of the periods represented in Three Ages. He, he did the Stone Age set. And maybe more in recollection of that than of the Chaplin film that they, they started to go for Flying Elephants. I rather think they, they, they'd seen that. It was only a few years before they probably decided they could get some mileage out of it. I think probably the Keaton of anything. In each case, they're imposing 20, a 20th century perspective on the Stone Age, I suppose. Less so in Flying Elephants than some others, but but we're seeing the Stone Age from our own vantage point, and that's what under, that's what underlines the Flintstones, I mean, I mentioned. They, they, yeah, they created a 20th century style society in a Stone Age setting. That was the thing. Um, one of the funniest American newspapers, BC, has a Stone Age setting, but it has the contrast of a very slick, hip, modern-day wit in that context. So it's the same principle, really. Um, and I think of all these, Flying Elephants is probably the least amusing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> it, it's it, no, it, 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 it's it's funny, but it's it's just disappointing if you look yeah. at the film surrounding it. That's yes, all. I think as you say, you, we've got to keep it in, in context as to you know how it was released and to whom. And uh, yeah, it's as you say, it has its moments. It is funny in parts, but um, yeah, when when you've gone from two detectives think 
and you finally think we're here, we've arrived, and then you, <laughs> you get thrown into that. I mean, you could, I could probably handle it better if Stan's character was a little bit more sailors beware, that kind of yes. assertive, you know. Um, but the little Twinkle Star, I mean, that is just, <laughs> just departure <laughs> from what we, you know, what we're getting used to. But still, yeah. But yeah, I mean, at least at least the Chester Chase cab driver from Sailors Beware would have attempted to fight back. He does, yes, in that. yes, he yeah, does. Least, yeah, I love least, that film. Yeah. Yeah, he gives the mighty giant played by Hardy a, a bit more of a run for his club. <laughs> but but no, there's, there's, there's no competition there, and uh, there's not much plot either. It's a basic situation, King ordering all men to, to marry, pain of death, banishment, or both of them. Or yes, and, yeah, that's right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, so Hardy's trying to get various girls, um, looking looking for a wife, anyone. Uh, and keeps getting knocked back, so knocked forward. He keeps getting you know, attacked by animals, or something falls in him, or maybe tries to uh, chat up a girl, and uh, doesn't get anywhere. And uh, he decides that he wants um, little twinkle stars in, in, in blushing rose, a daughter of Finlayson's character, the aged saxophonist. Oh, yeah, was it, yeah, yeah, the wizard. Was it ye aged? Now that's that's the other thing. Um, a, 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 a conflation of historical periods between the Stone Age setting and the titling, which is mock old English. That's right, yes. You know, ye first, ye forty, or whatever, you know, <laughs> wilt thou, wilt thou not? And, 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 yeah. If they be speaking old or middle English in the Stone Age. <laughs> oh, it, oh, it's all history. It's all the same. Yeah, it's Shakespeare. Yeah. It's fine. <laughs> yes, imagine you know, the Merchant of Venice and the Quarry or something. <laughs> you know, two, 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 two gentlemen of Jurassic Park. I mean. <laughs> so yeah, so we so we mentioned um, Viola Richards' character uh, that uh, Ollie sort of uh, sets his uh, his sights on, um, mm. and you know Viola Richards, she's in both of the films that we're looking at today. What can you what can you tell us about Viola Richards, Glenn? It's quite interesting. That uh, well, it's pleasing though that we can talk about Viola Richard now because what's very easy to forget is that um, certainly when I was starting to 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 collect and study these films, I, we didn't know anything about the people very much. Many of the people were not known to us, and we we knew their names because um, there were some, there were sometimes cast lists on screen, so we know. Who they we knew, we knew who they were, they knew their names, and people like William Caberson were writing about the likes of Viola Richard, Edna Marion, Anita Garvin, and so on. Um, and Youngson was name checking them in the, in the narrations of the films, but that's all we knew. We didn't know even if they were still living, and in many instances, they were, but nobody found them, and I think too often. They didn't realise that there was the interest. They were probably not aware of the books and so on, where they were being written about in terms of what they'd done all those years, what they probably didn't know, and didn't expect anybody to be interested seriously after all those years. So it wouldn't have occurred to them even to come forward. I think it was really only a chance thing like that that brought Anita Garvin out of obscurity in about a year or something. Um, and this is that was six years after Everson had enthused about her in his, in his Lauren and Hardy book. Um, she didn't know people were interested. And I remember looking at these films and, and learning, oh, oh, that's Viola Richard, that's it, about knowing who was who. But it didn't necessarily even occur to me um, that they might still be alive because, all right, these films at the time were maybe, what, 40, 45 years old or something. And this wasn't just me having a youngster's, a youngster's perspective, because at that time, films from the silent era and the early talk era were really considered ancient, a lost civilization. And it's a bit like us now looking at a film from 1980 back to about 1975 or something, and thinking the same thing, and we, and we don't. Not, not, in, not in any, anything like the same way. This is not a lost civilization. And, and we don't assume that all the people must be dead so long ago. But we, but that was the thinking then. And in far too many instances, those people were still around, but nobody knew. Nobody got them. Nobody, nobody interviewed them. 
or even let them know that there was the interest. I, I find that tragic. Yes, absolutely. I really do. And yeah. one of those was Viola Richard, who we knew nothing about, really, biographically, until quite recent years, probably within the last 15 years. Um, when I uh, tried to assemble a, an entry for her in the Laurel and Hardy Encyclopedia, there wasn't much to go on. No dates. We you know, didn't know where she was born, when she died, where she was from, anything. Um, I don't. I don't think the first edition of Randy's book had anything either. I don't remember. I don't think, I don't think there was anything. And then we had uh, the results of some research that had gone on, and it turned up on a website called Wax Apple. Oh yeah, in about two thousand six or something. That um, which credits the uh, the research work of Bill Capello. And apparently he was the one who found out where she was from, uh, when she was born, when she died, and what had become of her. We only had fragmented information. Essentially, we knew that she was part of that group of girls that Hal Roach had under contract in the late 20s and then decided to let go all at once for reasons unclear. Um, always, always assumed to be economy, one of his economy drives, and also one of his occasional bad decisions because. They, they really had potential. They were, they, were, they were terrific, and they were an asset. We let them go. Um, Viola Richard, Edna Marion, Dorothy Coburn. Um, I'm not sure when Martha Sleeper went, but the same sort of thing, you know. And we knew that Viola Richard had been in these various Hal Roach films of that period, and not much else. But... Um, Apparently, there'd been some confusion over another Viola Richard who had been a wardrobe mistress at the Fox, who'd committed suicide, probably not or something, in 1955. Some people thought that sadly it was the Viola Richard from the Roach pictures. It wasn't somebody else. And it turns out that she'd actually, she was actually stood around until late December 1973. Years after the likes of Everson had been started writing about her, after the Youngson films, and yeah, she was still there and nobody interviewed her about her work at Hal Roach. Um, but all we'd known was this period at Roach. And I, I remember quite a number of years ago now, um, David Wyatt, well known historian collector, tipped me off to an earlier film appearance of Viola Rich pre Hal Roach, which I don't think anybody knew about. And it, one of those interesting cases where the film proper is, is lost, but there is a surviving home movie edition on 9.5 under a different title, which made things even more confusing in a sense. <laughs> um, but more recently, a, um, a longer copy of that, of the 9.5, has just turned out and been put online, which is only in recent months. Um, this, this version runs for about 29 minutes or something. Have a look anyway. It's the original title of it was Exclusive Rights. It was 1926, picture film. There was a, obviously a very minor company called Preferred Pictures, and I don't know anything about them, but it's evident that Viola Richard got a break in a feature from a very minor studio. And this 9.5 version of it is called The Bickle Affair. That's B I C K E L, Bickle Affair. And that is, yeah, and it's on YouTube at the moment. At any rate, things do get, but this it's up there now as we speak. Okay, and um, I'd seen the bit that David had previously, and this is this longer copy. And I say this, I think, is posterity's first look at Viola Rich. Yeah, yeah, and I could be mistaken. I I could be very mistaken. So don't hold me to this. But there's a scene in a nightclub, and Viola is. Dressed as a society woman, she witnesses a murder in the nightclub. Among the things you spot at the nightclub is a floor show with some dancers. And I think one of the dancers is Dorothy Coburn. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So it's quite possible that they got to know each other and entered pictures together. Together, yeah. It's my only concern. It's, yeah, I'm not 100% sure, but I think it's worth investigating. Yeah, definitely. Oh, that's really interesting. Further research. Yeah. So, um, so there's so anyway, there she was in this feature and talking about the shows and how wrote, which probably seemed like a, a 
would have been a considerable break after a minor part in the minor, the minor studio, like preferred pictures. Yeah. Uh, Roach had quite a reputation, so this would have been a big step up. Yeah. Um, I mean, just, it would obviously be seen as a step up for Edna Marion because uh, she didn't come out of nowhere. She had leading roles at Christie. It was, she was one of the, uh, the prominent uh, le- leading ladies in the Al Christie comedies of the mid-20s, with people like Neil Burns and so on. Yeah. And she went to Rome. And my friend, she, she finished up getting less to do because um, at Christie, she often had a sort of female protagonist role. She would be the lead comic's wife, for example. Have a lot to do with the plot and the action. At Roach, she there was this tendency to be a bit more decorative, you know. Yes, yeah. You know, she'd be there as the maid. She'd be there as Charlie Chase's wife, but yeah. she, but she wouldn't get to do much more except complain. <laughs> yeah. Um, whereas in the Christie's, she was rather more involved directly in the action. So, yeah. but made that move. So Roach must have obviously was. A step up from Mount Christie. Yeah, absolutely. Who was, kind of, was kind of number three, and Roach was number two, fast becoming number one in the comedy stupid. Yeah. And so, so yeah, going to Hal Roach would have been a um, you know, career move up for all of them, including Viola Richard. And um, and we see we see her in um, we see her in several of the Laurel and Hardys, but also the Charlie Chases. And um, it's interesting that. Uh, also, she worked with Mac Dav- Max Davidson, and posterity does seem to have been determined to erase Viola Richard from the Max Davidson story. It does, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. I've seen yeah. some stills. I think it was Chris again, again on, on uh, Facebook was just uh, sharing some stills of her covered in cake. Yeah, uh, that, well, that's the the uh, the the. the uh, come on, I'll, I'll start that again. I'm, I'm sorry, my my throat is dry. Oh, I'm don't still worry. Not, I'm still not quite over the last week business, you know. No, no, no. Um, Oh. Speaking some of the much needed tea my wonderful wife brought it a little while ago. <laughs> um, but yes, um, that was um, Love Him and Feed Him, which was the film that was meant to have been a Laurel and Hardy, but finished up being Davidson and Hardy. Um, because Stan had spent the 1927 summer break going home to Britain to see his family when the most of the rest of them went to Canada. Oh, right, yes. Um, uh, they got back in time. He didn't. He was late. So they started the film without him, and Max Davidson took what should have been the Stan Laurel role. And uh, right. all that's turned up of, it, of this is a brief pause fragment, positive fragment, and Viola is not visible. Um, they've got the cutting continuity, because it's an MGM. Mm-hmm. And we know from that there's some stills that she's in the big, Slapstick right at the end. Yeah. Along with Thelma Hill, who who was very good. We she she was more associated with, with Senate comedies, but she did do some at Rope, like two tars. One of the right. two tars. And she's in one of the talkies shows. I mean, mixed up, she's in that. But she was more of a Senate name than Roach. But it's it's Thelma Hill and, and Viola Richards who were the two female characters in this. And yeah, we can see from the stills was another battle of the century or two. Yeah. Um, but we don't see any actual footage of Viola Richard in what survives, unfortunately. And and the same is true of some of the Max Davidsons. Um, um, I don't know if blow by blow exists. Dumb Daddies, um, her footage, that was probably very interesting, but rehearsing a play with Max's son and she's supposed to be the, uh, the wronged woman in a shawl carrying a baby coming in. And they're only stills. We don't have the we don't have the footage of that. Right. Um, from came the dawn. The footage, the surviving footage in that shows her as the daughter of the house, standard ingenue stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas the, the obviously funny scenes, the the, the 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 mock horror stuff overnight with her boyfriend, where she would have had the opportunities, all that's missing. Typical. Still, yeah. So. Um, <laughs> So, yes, so I, I, I do think that posterity has, has decided to edit Viola Richard out oh. of the Max Davidson story. What a shame. Yeah. Yeah. But we do have quite a bit to, to see still, thanks to the other survivors. Yeah. And uh, two detectives think, talk about she's Dave Finlayson's wife, or the Judge Foozle, as he's called. So That's it's, right. It is Foozle. Yeah. 
right? And both very young. She was, she was born in 1904, um, Canadian birth, by the way. Um, right. Family moved to the States. Family moved to the States when she was six. But um, so she, was, she was, what, she was 23 years old and could do mature society work. Yeah. The ingenue, she was a society woman, she could be vengeful by that was the thing about about this this group of young women that they, they had that versatility. Yeah, they could they could all do that, and uh, she, she's superbly elegant as, as Judge Boozle. Um, I remember this lovely lovely bit where she approaches the sleeping Phyllis and the behind, and uh, strokes his neck with her clo with her fan. Yes. And of course, he's, he wakes thinking his throat's being slashed. <laughs> Right. <laughs> <laughs> but this wonderful, wonderful, elegant but affectionate gesture with which she sweeps around his throat. <laughs> yeah. So, she, so she, she could do elegant society woman, or she could do uh, wide-eyed ingenue, which is pretty much all she gets to do in flying elephants. Yeah, which sadly does waste most of the talent involved, including hers. Um, the big thing at the end, of course, everybody scrapes under the upturned wagon with a bear. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's there's not much, like, there's not much more to be said about it no but she, no. Told, but she was so good and Charlie Chase knew how to you um, the, the, the real, really famous one is Limousine Love yes um, there she uh, you know, newcomers start here um, on the way to his wedding Charlie in a closed back limousine uh, we used to call it a land dog type, I think. Yeah. You could close it off, and you'd have curtains on the windows if you wanted to pull them. Uh, <laughs> there, in the back of the limo, is Viola Richard naked. Nope. There was, there was a perfectly good reason for this. <laughs> <laughs> do I want to bother telling people the perfectly good reason for this? <laughs> it, do we need the perfectly good reason for this? <laughs> uh, does it not justify itself? But. Uh, uh, I think yes, we've got to, no, we've got to justify it. Yeah, family show. <laughs> yeah, family show, yes. <laughs> yeah. I don't like to think who's family by this stage, but, uh, but anyway. <laughs> but no, um, she is uh, being taught to drive by her husband, Nick Kennedy, and she is a terrible driver. And eventually the two of them have a spat. Kennedy gets out, she goes off on her own, turns the car over into a huge puddle from which she emerges drenched. Right. Chase, Chase, meanwhile, thinks he's out of gas, as they'd say there, yeah. and has gone off to try and obtain some more, ignoring the fact that he's got a can on, on the running board. But while he's gone, she sees the she sees the car with the cur closed curtains and sees an opportunity to uh, to uh, take, take her clothes off so they can hang up and dry out outside the car while she's safely inside and concealed. <laughs> Right, she's in the car with the <clears throat> with the clothes attached loosely outside. He, but of course, he gets in, not knowing she's there, drives off, and the clothes get attached and disappear <laughs> into a sort of a running drain. <laughs> um, by a speaking tube, she announces her presence in the back and asks him to get, get her clothes, she'll explain later. So he goes off pursuing the clothes, and he's totally inept and fails to stop them disappearing down a drain. <laughs> so there she is in the back of his car with nothing on. And he's got to get to his wedding as well as get rid of her. <laughs> <laughs> and for the rest of it, go and see Limousine Love. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Absolutely. That sounds like <laughs> Yeah, the rest of it. But, but she's wonderful in it. Um, she manages to convey alternately um, defiance in, 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 in arguing with husband Kennedy, uh, a, a certain stroppiness and an insistence that she knows what she's doing. A wryness when she comes the most terrible cropper. <laughs> Good physical comedy when she's trying to shake herself dry, shaking the limbs to no avail, and this is rather wretched. Another wretched appearance. Um, instant delight of seeing an opportunity to get out of the situation. Yeah. And from thence, a mixture of, of terror, <laughs> embarrassment, <laughs> shock. <laughs> <laughs> and ultimately, in a confrontation with her husband, who proves to be faithless, mm. because she's still in, only uh, uh, basically basically wrapped up, they meet again. Right. Uh, he he doesn't he chats her up, not realizing it's his own wife. But she <laughs> goes from horror and discovery to fury and revenge at this faithless husband <laughs> in a blink. 
<laughs> Brilliant. So if, if you wanted one film as an introduction to Viola Richard, this yes, magazine. Yes, and her potential, that's right. Yeah, what she could do. And truth be told, Lauren and Hardy didn't give her as, as, as good an opportunity in any of this. She, she, she gets things to do. Yeah. But I don't think they appreciated her worth quite as well as Chase did. Yeah. Yeah. And and Fred and Fred Gill, by the way, the director of Limousine Love, I should say, who right. of course also directed uh, Do Detective Think. He yeah. was that was something we didn't get into actually. Who directed the embryonic Laurel and Hearts, most of the pathways and the earlier MGMs. Yeah, yeah, Fred Gill did most of them, didn't he? Fred Gill, yeah. Yeah. And the, the he he was he was, he was a good director, but not quite one. And as as Laurel and Hardy became more the thing, um, they, they were well, frankly they were given high profile director that they had, they were getting going to get a Leo, Leo McCary, of course, who was really behind the team, you think, and um, and been on the Charlie Chases. He was taken off the Charlie Chases to work with Laurel and Hardy. Yeah, and Chase's own brother Jimmy Parrott. Was taken off the Charlie Chases to work with Lauren. <laughs> and Fred Gill got left behind, but um, but it, it, he he actually maintained a bond though with their regular cameraman George Stevens. When Stevens left Roach and went to RKO, Gill went with him. Oh right, okay, yeah. And initially, Stevens, before he got into he got into features, was doing a series of shorts called Blondes and Redheads, which was very obviously a kind of continuation of the boyfriend's short been doing at Roach. Right. And even had Grady Sutton in them, who'd been in our Roach and Boyfriend series. And Gil was co-scripting these, at least initially. He continued to work as a co-scenarist and associate of George Stevens, even into the big feature films that Stevens did later on, you know, as far as Giant in the 50s and all the ones in between. Yeah. Uh, Fred Gill was, um, in a way, it was a bit like one of those things where the where the pupil outshines the teacher because Stevens as a cameraman would have been lower on the, in the pecking order than director Gill. Yeah. But Stevens became the big shot feature director and Gill was no longer directing but was a screenwriter in association with Stevens, which right. in, in the industry's eyes was a bit of a devotion, I suppose. But yeah. they obviously, obviously had a very strong working relationship. And Gill, incidentally, went back to Roach during the war, during the 1940s, when Roach was overseas with the, the US Army, right. they needed someone to, the film production continued then, they needed someone to run the show, and the, and the person they had running it was Fred Hill. <laughs> he was acting as producer in Roach's absence and directing some of the, the streamliners they were doing in the 40s. Oh, wow. Yeah, so yeah, having parted, yeah, being part of the Roach um, in, in the, you know, 20s, 30s cast, there he was back again running the place. Wow. So the Fred Gill story with Roach is actually quite an interesting circular tale. Yeah, yeah, on its own. That's, yeah, I didn't know anything about that. Yeah, so... Uh, uh, and Viola, oh, well, Viola Richard, uh, uh, and I was just reading an article the other day um, in the, the Laurel and Hardy magazine by um, Brad Farrell, and I think actually it was his article on Waxapple um, mm. originally uh, about Viola and how, how she she ended up, and she had quite a um, sort of a, well, an up and, up and down tragedy and different things with husbands um yes perishing in house fires i think it was um yeah she she was she was very unfortunate in that regard i mean the, the, the film career effectively ended when when roach got rid of her and uh, she apparently was was comfortably off anyway and so she had some business interests got married um married to an alexander kempner mm. and that apparently that um that marriage ended in, in divorce because of his cruelty, um, which is a, a great, you know, obviously a terrible thing. Mm. Um, so that's why that marriage didn't last. During that time, she did come back to the screen once. Um, she was in one talkie. It's called The Lineup, um, a great rarity. And that's online if you want to have a look at it. Oh, okay. it's, the only t- it's the only time we get to hear her voice. Right. But the sound quality isn't great. I don't think the original recording was particularly good, as with a lot of 1929 talkies, frankly. Yeah. But the nearest idea we're going to get to what she sounded like. Yeah, yeah. So uh, it, runs, it runs about half an hour. and uh, but, but anyway, it's online, the line But yeah, her, um, 
her marital history at this point was was very sad. The second husband you mentioned, apparently he was um, in a wheelchair and died in a house fire. In fact, couldn't get out because he was grief. wheelchair bound. Oof. And uh, a terrible business. And uh, yeah, he did. A, he did eventually marry for a third time. Um, was a professor of philosophy or something of that that area. Yeah, um, who we understand um, may well have influenced her into a religious bent, a very a, a spiritual way of thinking. And apparently, um, this was something that sustained her a lot. She, she became ill. She died, as I said, in. in 1973, so uh, 69 years old. Yeah. Not a, and apparently the, 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 the faith she had required, developed, and nurtured apparently sustained her a lot during that last illness. Yeah. Um, but she'd, uh, she, she'd had uh, uh, flirtations with, with the business in between. He, she came back, she, well, she, she was on the stage at one point, and at the same time, I think it's having an involvement in a cosmetics firm, a cosmetics oh. company, but, um, but she does come back to Hal Roach in the mid-30s, briefly, just doing walk-ons, bit part. Oh, um, yeah, she was in Tit for Tat, I think, wasn't she? she yeah, she's one of the parties by Tit for Tat, and uh, she was visible in one of the stills, and I was never sure if it was her or not, but then looking at the footage in a frame grab, um, I was inclined to believe it. Yeah, I thought, yes, that is her. And also be spotted in an hour gang called uh, Spruce Him Up. Right. So, so she'd obviously gone back to the studio. Perhaps she was going to, she could get in the way of pass and mm. his walk on, didn't do anything else, anything beyond that. She was clearly in there and trying. And uh, yeah. apparently she's listed in a casting directory in the mid 30s, but only 36 or something. But, um, so she was obviously making attempts. Probably not very strong ones. I think she had other interests. Right. Right. So, uh, but she was a mystery woman. I said, really, until yeah, all this, this website report. And um, everybody else is immensely grateful that they that they managed to turn up all the information at last. Yeah. You yeah. really wondered who this woman really was since I was about twelve. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and only in recent years we find out. It's amazing, isn't it? Absolutely amazing. Yeah. Brilliant. <laughs> Now, if you're a member of our Blogheads Facebook group, you might remember a few weeks ago I invited members to send me an audio recording of your thoughts on our films in focus, as I'm really keen to include the thoughts of fellow Blogheads on the podcast. Uh, And for this episode, I've selected a response from Bill Oates. Bill is not only a member of the Blogheads group, but he's also the editor of the ITJ, or the Intratent Journal, being the newsletter of the Sons of the Desert, which is the International Laurel and Hardy Society. And he is also a keen advocate of the film Flying Elephants. This episode is actually quite timely, as the ITJ is currently running a four-part article on the shooting locations of Flying Elephants, written by Jim Kirkhoff. And if you'd like to find out more information about subscribing to the ITJ, Bill gives more details at the end of his recording, so do listen out for that, and I'll also put a link in the show notes too. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Bill, and he's going to talk to you about his thoughts on flying elephants. See who that is, it might be him. Hello? Hello Patrick, this is Bill from the United States, representing the Intertent Journal. Sorry, this has taken a little while, but I've had a few uh, setbacks here, technically speaking. I'm now talking into the laptop, and I hope this comes out well. Uh, I guess I'm trying to tell you why I like flying elephants, and for the most part, uh, there are a variety of reasons. I like a lot of the Laurel and Hardy films before they became the famous team, because after you see the main movies, Um, you don't have much else to go on unless we find Hats Off or The Rogue Song. So we go backwards and find some of these early films, which essentially, this was not a Laurel and Hardy film. This was a Finn and Hardy and Laurel film. Um, Hal Roach was trying to make Finn a star, one of the many people coming out of his all-stars. But um, nonetheless, I think it's a fun film. Also, it represents the end of the Path A films, And this is when they start uh, bumping up in quality when he goes with MGM. And then finally, this is part of his great experiment in Nevada. 
uh, about a decade and a half before the great movement came from the East Coast, from New York, New Jersey, and Philadelphia, to either Florida and then eventually Florida, I mean, Florida, eventually California, sorry. And uh, he thought there might be another place. Well, Nevada was ripe for picking. Unfortunately, it was uh, quite a challenge at 110, 115 degrees. I don't know if that works out to Celsius, but that's hot. And getting there was also a problem. Uh, even uh, Route 66, famed 66, didn't even come close to where they were filming. Uh, Las Vegas, Nevada was nothing at the time. Most everything in Nevada was up in the north in Carson City and Virginia City. So he thought he'd give it a try. The good news is, even though he didn't shoot many films there and thought it would be long term, uh, he eventually got to sell the, uh, the way I understand it, he sold the property to the government so they could build the Boulder Dam. And so that worked out just fine. Anyway, why did I choose Flying Elephants as a tent name? Well, there were not many tent names left when I joined in 1986. Also, my son's favorite early film when he was a little kid was Flying Elephants. And yes, because of the animated elephants for 10 seconds or whatever they're on. And then finally, my favorite animal is the element. It is the elephant. By the way, uh, Flying Deuces was already taken. So we watch this, and I see how this fits in with a lot of the films that have already been made for prehistoric times. And again, Roach was experimenting with all of his all-stars. And uh, in this case, he thought, well, I'm out there with uh, Babe shooting uh, No Man's Law, which was Babe Hardy at his evilest. And he thought, well, I'll bring Stan out, and we'll make a film out here. And he brought Stan and Finn and a number of the girls out to make this film. And uh, uh, it worked out just fine as far as I'm concerned. It's a fun film. It has lots of gags, a lot of silliness in the desert. Uh, they actually try to speak with a kind of a, what would we say, an old English accent in the uh, subtitles. But uh, it fits in with a number of other films. Chaplin had made his prehistoric past in 1914 at Keystone. And then Keith, uh, Keaton had also made The Three Ages. And one of those ages is prehistoric. But I think one thing that was very influential was The Lost World. that came out in 1925, the one that was animated by Willis O'Brien, who eventually would uh, make a little film called King Kong. Uh, by the way, if you see The Lost World, uh, here's, here's a uh, spoiler. Uh, the dinosaurs get crazy and wander all over London and wreak havoc. So long story short, that's why I like this film mainly because of the silliness, and also if we look at the time period, if you look at all the films that Laurel and or Hardy made between the late 1926 and early 1928, there are a dozen or more, and that includes times when they're in support of Finn, uh, that'd be Love and Them Weep and With Love and Hisses and Do Detectives Think. And a lot of people think that when De Do Detectives Think came out, that uh, Laurel and Hardy were on a roll. Well, they really weren't. This was all part of a great experiment because even though Flying Elephants was not our Laurel and Hardy, neither was uh, Sugar Daddy's. Uh, Randy Scredfed says there's little Laurel and Hardy in it. We have to wait until they shift completely to MGM, and this would be their second film there for a second hundred years, where MGM uh, looks at them and says, you know, by golly, these guys are pretty good. However... Uh, even though they're being touted as a team, we have a number of shows that came out uh, that were a variety of things. It weren't really Laurel and Hardy with the Derby hats as a team. You know, things like uh, Putting Pants on Philip, which happens to be uh, one of my favorites. Uh, Babe Hardy keeps supporting uh, our gang and uh, Max Davidson in some films, but eventually they make their transition. So... Um, that's what I have on it. I think one of the homages, and, and really a, uh, a lame one, is in uh, the scene, just really briefly, Stan looks in the bushes, and there's a triceratops, which is not much bigger than a horse. I think that's basically an homage to the lost world. But, uh, you know, it's we have Stan and Ollie working with each other, both of them working with Finn, but uh, I think the real uh, kicker is when we see Viola Richard and the other prehistoric gals. That's kind of a great thing. One thing I want to let you know is if people are interested in the ITJ, they can contact me at itj.inbox 
at gmail.com. And we are in, we are just about to release the fall edition, uh, which has the second uh, filming locations of Flying Elephants by Jim Kirkhoff. There will be four in all. So if you have any other questions, give me a jingle via email or however you do it. And uh, I wish you well. You're probably well asleep at this time. All the best. Over and out. Bye-bye. Who was it? Oh, some fella having a joke. Bill, thanks so much for sharing your thoughts with us. It was really great to hear from you. And if you'd like to be a part of a future episode, you need to be a member of our Blockheads Facebook group, and you can find details on how to submit your recordings there. And I really would love for you to be a part of one of our future shows. So, Glenn, if we could just talk a little bit more about your three encyclopedias, the Laurel and Hardy, Marx Brothers and Chaplin encyclopedias. I'm just curious as to why did you choose those three particularly? I mean, why, for instance, did you not choose Buster Keaton, say, or Harold Lloyd? Mm. Well, the Laurel and Hardy chose itself because the pe- people were saying to me, you should write a book on Laurel and Hardy. So it was, it was, it was rather chosen for me. The... Uh, the the um, success of the thing actually led the publishers to ask me what I wanted to do next because they were very pleased with it. And they said, well, you know, are there some others you could give the same treatment? I said, well, yes, there are. And this was guided to some extent by the comedians on whom I had the most information. Sure. At that time, um, the Marx Brothers and Chaplin were the, the ones I had the most on. Right, and the the next book in the series, which you actually haven't mentioned in the questions, but it doesn't matter. Uh, the fourth book was a general book about silent comedy. It was the A to Z of silent film comedy. Yeah, yeah. And when we we when we were discussing the next one as well, we thought, okay, we'll go with Mark Brothers because it's the one that I think will continue the idea of, of writing about comedy teams specifically. So it continued that thread, and and I was able to put together more than enough information for the Marx Brothers Encyclopedia that worked. And um, by that time, I, I, I got used to working in that format. I think the Marx Brothers book probably is a more efficient book than the Laurel and Hardy in terms of its construction. Right. Because, only because I got used to doing them. And I also learned from experience the type of thing you can do without certain digressions and things. Easy, too easy to digress when you get into. So, um, but yes, so the Marx Brothers were second. And again, Chaplin, on whom I had a lot of material and a great deal of interest, was the logical third. And after that, as I said, we did the uh, the A to Z of silent film comedy, which, if I remember correctly, was actually commissioned at the same time as the Chaplin. It was a two book arrangement. And the creation of the two books overlapped in considerable ways. A lot of the time, there were uh, personnel who applied to both and had also been written up in previous books. So they, in a way, they, they wrote each other to some degree. But um, but anyway, we, I got the, the A to Z of silent film comedy finished and we started to talk about doing either Keaton or Lloyd as an encyclopedia. And I gave serious consideration to, to both of them. And uh, at that time, uh, David McLeod had just published a book about Keaton's work in the talking era, The Sound of Buster Keaton, very good book. And it was still just out, it was still very recent. And I, I didn't want to write eating volume of any sort. Yeah. I wanted David's book to have its, have its turn, have its run, before I got into uh, the area of Keaton books. So I would put Keaton on the back burner. And... Which reason we started to talk about Harold Lloyd. And a strange thing is that some sort of rumor got out to the effect that I was either writing one or had actually written and published one. And for a while on the internet, there were references for years afterwards <laughs> to a Harold Lloyd encyclopedia I'd written. No, I never, <laughs> I didn't even start to write a Harold Lloyd encyclopedia. Right. And the reason I didn't was that when I started to put together the possibilities for this. I realized that I wasn't the right person to do it. Simple as that. And the best qualified person to write a Harold Lloyd encyclopedia in my acquaintance really was Annette D'Agostino, who 
subsequently married a man named Lloyd. Um, <laughs> and, and Annette knew the Harold Lloyd history in far greater depth and breadth than I ever could, particularly in terms of the earlier films, I felt, um, and the missing films. Annette really knew the subject and could do it justice. I, felt I could do it justice, and I felt that I couldn't. So, you know, so I said, no, Annette, you're the one to write this. And she eventually did. She did do the Harold Lloyd history. And it, and, and it was the right person who did it. So um, by the time all this had moved on, um, Batsford had gone under. And I was finding it enormously difficult to get the sort of publishing deal that would make it viable. I, I was never paid a fortune. I didn't, I didn't receive a huge advance at any of these. But what I did get was an amount that enabled me to to get by, plus the other things I was doing, the radio script writing and so on, to get by for the amount of time it took to write the things. Um, in general, I suppose these took about 18 months to two years, on well, an average of 18 months to write, I suppose, during which time I had to live out meat. And by the uh, 2000s, there really weren't the, the book deals for this type of book open to me. I wasn't getting anything offered that made it viable. So, so, so people often ask me, why haven't you written any more of these books? Well, that's the reason. Yeah, well, if nobody wants to publish them, there's no point writing them. Is the, that's one of those things. Yeah, if, if, you know, if, um, if a sympathetic publisher out there wants to give me a reasonable advance, not asking for a fortune, just a reasonable advance to finance the writing of another one of these, I'd be happy to do it. Right, well, there we go then. And if they can't get in touch with you, they can send me the message and I'll pass it on. <laughs> yes, just, right, because you've already said, I, I'm not visible on social media. I, I yeah. physically do not exist. That's it. That's this it. is deliberate. So any publishers, <laughs> write to the Laurel and Hardy blog and we'll put you in touch with Glenn. No problem. We'll get you that book for you, Glenn. No problem. <laughs> Thanks. I, need, I, 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 I really need to do one of these. I need to get another book out of my system. <laughs> That's fine. So if you could, if which one would you do, Glenn, if you could do one? Oh, I wish I knew now. Um, perhaps, belatedly, the Keaton Encyclopedia, since it still hasn't been done as far as I'm aware. Yeah, no, I don't think so. That would be really nice. Yeah, that would be really yeah. good. And it would be the logical progression of the considerable gap, you know, from the previous yeah. one. So maybe. Oh, it's due. It's got to be done. Well, we've got to get that sorted out. <laughs> And the very, very final question I have for you is, um, do you have any current or future projects that you'd like to plug whilst you whilst you have our ears? Oh, wish I had. <laughs> <laughs> no, not really. Um, change of tack professionally in a way, because I remember earlier on, and I don't know if you're gonna, this is going to survive the edit, but I made a reference to the fact that I'd originally intended to become an illustrator. Oh, yes, yeah. Yes, you did. I did yeah, I'd intended to go to art college, but that didn't happen. I became a writer instead because that was the other thing I could do. <laughs> but in more recent times, I've been going back to it. I, I have done a bit over the years. But one, one of the things I was involved with for a long time was uh, comedy writing for the, the Radio 2 comedy sketch show, the News Headlines, a satire show. And sometimes they needed drawings for promotional purposes. In one instance, it was a listener's comedy or things, um, but sometimes they enjoy it. And the BBC started to take website things more seriously, we were putting more on. The the show was represented by some text, but also some cartoons, which I did. I was an occasional cartoonist profession. Uh, I got to draw Roy Hub star quite well in the end, I thought, actually. <laughs> Roy had left us, of course, earlier this year. Um, but... Um, but a few years ago, I decided to try and polish up skills a bit because I hadn't really been drawing much for a long time. I was mostly writing. And I noodled around a, a bit, and my wife looked at what I managed to do with it so far and suggested I should continue it. And it grew into a graphic novel, a full length graphic novel. Wow. Yeah, and um, it's still unpublished. I, I did hawk it around a bit, it didn't get any taken. And Looking at it now, I think I can understand why, because I don't think it's as good as I thought it was originally. And uh, in the interim, an old friend of mine got in touch saying that he was writing a children's humorous storybook and was looking for an illustrator. And I thought, well, right, let's kind of go. So I tried some sample drawings and he was very pleased. And um, again, we are still looking for a publisher for this children's storybook and the subsequent volumes. 
this has the potential for a multi-volume set. We haven't got a publisher and we are looking for one. So, so anyone out there who wants to publish a show, I think it's funny. This is no credit to me because he wrote it. Very funny children's storybook with illustrations by me. Please get in touch. Yeah. Is, that and, a, is, it, is it like a picture book or is it like a, a children's novel well, with illustrations it's throughout? A, it's, 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 it's a novel. Um, right. It's a novel with intermittent illustrations. There are two or three drawings per chapter. Yeah. But it's text-driven. It's a storybook. And uh, I think I, I think it's good. But, um, but when I started to do these, he was frankly pushing on pushing me a bit about my game somewhat. It was a bit more polished. Right. So I started putting more into them. And, uh, and this goes back to what I was trying to do in the first place, get back to me the artwork and improve it and get back some of the old skills and maybe improve on what I've had before. Yeah. And I found that once I'd, I'd worked on these drawings for him, they'd reached a standard that made the graphic novel look sick. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I, looked at, I, th- I looked at thought, oh, can we do better than this? Yes. So I, start, I started to do the graphic novel over again. Right. And bring it up to the same standard of, of, of drawings as per the children's story. Uh, we're about two thirds of the way through that. So, um, um, if anybody wants to talk to me about the children's storybook or a graphic novel, I am here, if not on social media. But no, but all, all the best with uh, all the best with that. I will, uh, I will watch watch that with uh, with much interest. And if anybody gets in touch through the, the the blog, I shall pass them on to you, Glenn, with with pleasure. So great, thanks again. Um, all that is left is for me to say thank you ever so much for joining us. It's been wonderful to chat to you about Laurel and Hardy oh. and and everybody else besides Glenn. It's been fantastic. So thank you so much for spending time with us today. No, I really enjoyed it. Thanks, Patrick. Thanks for asking. And this has this been really good. Um, really and would you, would you come back on again in, uh, for a future episode? Yeah, happy to, yes. It Wonderful. Me, please. Yes, please ask. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. That's great. <laughs> Thanks ever so much. Cheers, Patrick. Cheers, Ben. All the best. Now, you take care. Okay. Yeah, you too. Bye. He is a great guy, isn't he? He certainly is. You know I like him. <laughs> And so, sadly, we find ourselves at the end of yet another episode. But before we go our separate ways, I'd just like to say a thank you again for all the positive comments and reviews that you've been leaving me. Firstly, over on Apple Podcasts, thank you to Paul R. Starling, Living on the Edge, that rolls off the tongue, uh, for your review and your kind words. Over on eBay, sorry, not eBay, uh, over on Podbay again, thank you to, I think it's Frontier Bree. It's very cheesy. Frontier Brie, uh, thanks for your kind words and for your review. Um, in fact, one reviewer on Podbay actually describes me as an international treasure. Well, they've obviously never met me. <laughs> but I can't go without saying the usual thank yous to um, the Bohunks Orchestra. Uh, you can find CDs of their fabulous music on my Amazon store, and also there's links in the show notes. Um, thank you to the many authors whose work I use in writing and researching my blogs and also these podcasts. Thank you to Michael Errett for putting me in touch with Glenn Mitchell. And of course, thank you, special thank you to Glenn Mitchell himself for being such a great guest and making these last two blogcasts so enjoyable and so informative. In the next episode, we're going to be discussing the silent short Sugar Daddies. So if you'd like to record and send me a brief recording of your own thoughts, you can find the email address to send that to in the show notes and also on the Laurel and Hardy blog website, of course. But remember, you do have to be a member of the Blogheads Facebook group before you do that. Uh, And finally, thank you to the members of the Blockheads Facebook group for all your great interaction and conversation. Um, But most importantly, I've got to say thank you to you once again for being here with me. Um, It really wouldn't be a show without you, the listeners. Um, And until next time, I think all that's left now is to say goodbye from him. Goodbye. Goodbye from him. Goodbye. And it's goodbye from me. Goodbye.